Hey guys, Strobe Light here, and I'd like to welcome you to the first video of a series where I'm going to be reviewing what I've affectionately dubbed the Badass Shooter. This is a genre of video game where you are the one-man apocalypse and must use your badassery to fuck shit up. This type of game holds a special place in my heart, so I thought what better way to start this series than by reviewing one of the legends of the genre, Left 4 Dead 2. This quintessential PvE shooter is unlike anything else on the market. It's so good, its gameplay holds up over 10 years after its release, and it has also spawned a plethora of fan content. This content spans from fan animations, to SFM shorts, to whole channels dedicated to the game's interesting lore. Not to mention the badass speedrunning community that has kept this game alive years after it is released. This timeless masterpiece is one game that every fan of FPS's should own, so without further ado, let's get into this review, and as my man Ellis says, Kill all sons of bitches. That's my official instructions. Now, following the release and commercial success of Left 4 Dead just one year prior, Valve realized that there was a lucrative market in making zombies games. This made them eager to make another one as soon as humanly possible. And remember, you gotta remember this, this game was developed at the height of the zombies game craze. So Valve and the developer, Turtle Rock Studios, known for other games like Evolve and Back for Blood, understood that they had to make a quick turnaround in developing the next mainline game before their competitors could catch up. Left 4 Dead 2. Ridiculous. A year later. So after the reveal of Left 4 Dead 2 not long after the release of the last one, many fans were left flabbergasted because one year to develop a fully fleshed out video game is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Hell, even Activision realized this with Call of Duty whenever they add studios like Treyarch and Sledgehammer to their lineup so they can make the exact same fucking game every single year. So when November 17th, 2009 rolled around, the critics and skeptics alike were prepared to see a buggy, broken mess, and boy, were they proven wrong. Turtle Rock and Valve somehow found a way to not only replicate the feel of the first game, but they also expanded upon and increased the amount of weapons, usable items, special infected, as well as providing a cast of characters that are so memorable that they are recognized by people who have never even heard of the Left 4 Dead franchise. So, what better way to start than by discussing these characters that have kept fans coming back to and talking about the game for years. Who the hell puts an evac station of 30 flights of goddamn stairs? Helicopter. Maybe the helicopter. Maybe it's made of chocolate. <laughs> it takes a lot to create a memorable character. Whether it's an iconic design, a well thought out personality. Did I ever tell you the definition? Of insanity. Or even just extreme meme ability. Don't fuck with this, Senator! It is a hard as hell task that not many games can pull off effectively. Left 4 Dead 2, on the other hand, handles this amazingly, as simplicity is the name of the game here. Instead of creating heroes that have shoehorned personality traits to try and make them likable, the Left 4 Dead survivors are designed to be like your average everyday person trying to survive the apocalypse. Coach is a high school football coach who is kind of like the father figure of the group, whose presence alone is enough to keep the group anchored together. He also shares many interests with the dumb but lovable mechanic Ellis, who is a country bumpkin and likes nothing more than to tell stories of the good times, watch stock car racing, listen to rock music, and shoot the shit out of any infected who gets in his way. Now that dude, he's a man after my own heart. Now Rochelle, on the other hand, is the news reporter who cares for each member of the party equally and uses her previous sources in the media to provide an interesting look into the background of what caused the zombie virus to spread in the first place. This of course leaves Nick. Now Nick is a snarky smartass riverboat gambler who does not give a damn about anyone or anything but himself. Hey, lab girl, hey seed, tons of fun. This building is on fire. Grab a weapon and let's get the hell out of here. But. Through some of his voice lines though, you can tell that this is kind of a facade, as he truly cares about each person he's been stuck with to brave the apocalypse, even if he won't tell it to their faces. Shit, coach. I'll miss you. Their personality through their voice lines creates likable characters that you can slowly grow attached to as you play more and more of the game. I mean, through just these four voice lines alone, you know exactly what each character's role is immediately. Everybody, gather around. Let's pray. Dear Lord, see us safely through our time of trial in this mall, 
And please, Lord, let the food court be okay. I ever tell you about the time my buddy Keith and I were on the top of a burning building and we had to fight our way down like five floors of zombie? It... Wait a second. I guess that was you guys. Oh, shit, man. I can't wait to tell Keith about that one. Holy shit, zombies. I saw the news reports. Hell, I produced some, but wow. Your mom. This is even more spectacular whenever you consider that Left 4 Dead 1 had Bill, the grizzled vet, Francis, who hates everything, Zoe, the woman, and Lewis, the pill-popping office worker. All of these guys are extremely likable and provide a decent amount of comedic relief to contrast with the dark and depressing environment of each and every map. When things go back to normal, Zoe, Bill, I'm giving you both jobs. Francis, I'm gonna teach your ass how to read. In fact, the first game in the series is so beloved due in part to these expertly created characters that Valve added the entirety of the first game into Left 4 Dead 2 and even added in a free DLC later that had the paths of the two sets of characters collide. The only complaint I do have is that Rochelle isn't quite as memorable as the other seven characters available within the game. Her full set of dialogue wasn't even tapped until the last stand update in 2020. But that being said, because of that update, which was entirely comprised of community members' work, I can say that many issues with some characters like Rochelle have been somewhat resolved, but it's still something to note. It's not just those you play as though that are important to the tone and experience of the game, as the infected you're killing also help to create a realistic and desperate vibe to the world's atmosphere. Holy shit. Now the green flu, the thing that creates the infected, spreads so fast that the main events of the game only take place within one fucking month. And in that time, almost all the continental United States has been overrun by the zombie horde. To coincide with the endless onslaught of the infected, there are unique zombies in each map that have their own special characteristics that set themselves apart from the common infected. Some good examples of these are zombies like the construction zombie, who has soundproof headphones on so that he can't hear gunshots or pipe bombs that you're throwing. Another good one is the armored zombie. They are extremely resistant to bullets and must be shot from the back and even fucking clown zombies. Those fucking clown zombies are stupid. Their shoes attract zombies to your position from hundreds of feet away, and they make the most annoying noise you could even possibly imagine. Also, when I say the flu is rapidly mutating, I mean it. It mutates so fast that it can rewire the host's body to produce more of a certain chemical or modify their appearance beyond belief. This is where the special infected come into play. This is some grim shit we got ourselves into. Each of the special infected can be identified through extremely different designs from the rest of the zombies, and the sounds they make are equally haunting. On top of that, the game does an amazing job of communicating what special infected are around through the use of sound cues. Each of the special infected also provide a new element to the gaming experience as their abilities can completely change the course of a level in mere seconds. The infected are grouped into three main types that I have dubbed myself the grapplers, the projectile shooters, and the big bad mamma jammas. To start this, we're going to talk about the projectile shooters. The Boomer is a big chonky boy who has developed increased bile and gas production and is constantly burping and gurgling to relieve that built up gas pressure in its body. This leads to a satisfying popping effect whenever the Boomer is shot. He's special however, for the bile that is produced attracts zombies to your location from hundreds of feet away. The developers actually use this for the survivor's benefit because you can actually pick up things called boomer bile that if you throw can attract zombies to certain areas and make them attack each other. On the other hand though, make sure that he doesn't throw up on you or explode too close to you or else you're going to have a bad time and you won't be able to see a damn thing while they're mauling you apart. The next projectile based zombie is the spitter and I'm telling you right now, she is one ugly some bitch. She acts just like the boomer in terms of projectile except that she fires like a glob of a loogie that is composed mainly of stomach acid that will create a high damaging fluorescent green puddle whenever it's fired. And when killed, she will also leave a pool of acid in her wake. This can get very annoying, and I mean 
very fucking annoying as it is a superb area denial tool that can constrict the playable area and block your path of progression. Oh sweet, I can get through there, yeah. Now though, let's talk about the restricting zombies, the ones that kind of pull you in and keep you in one spot. The first of which is the smoker. This guy has smoked one too many packs of cigarettes in his day and has tumors growing all across his body. He also packs a huge ass tongue that he can fire long distances to constrict and pull survivors off of ledges and into hordes of zombies. If you kill him though, he explodes into a cloud of smoke that can restrict visibility as you move through it. The next guy up is the charger, the world class master debater. He will bull charge from across the map and slam into survivors, pinning them to the ground and smashing them into a pulp. Much like the charger, the parkour king known as the hunter will unleash an ungodly screech that can't be missed and he will pounce on survivors given the chance, slashing them to smithereens and pinning them to the ground. The jockey will quickly move across the map to pounce on your head and head hump you so hard, you don't even know what's going on at that point. He'll lead you away from the party and into hordes of infected or even off of cliffs. The next one, the witch, is the first of the big bad man pajamas. She is an extremely volatile anorexic woman who won't shut the fuck, won't stop crying. You must avoid using your flashlights, walking near her, shooting her, or even just looking at her. Because when you do, she will go into an unbridled rage and sprint towards you faster than I can run to the store to get some Mountain Dew. Also, she instantly downs you if you are even grazed by one of her razor sharp hands. And finally, I have left the baddest boy of them all for last. This guy is the tank, and holy hot damn is this one big mean motherfucker. He is comprised almost entirely of muscles, and his intro makes sure you will not miss his arrival. Being able to close the distance quickly, this guy requires all of your attention as he can throw rocks and cars that do an insane amount of damage. On top of that, one punch can send you flying at high speeds away from the group and get you into the worst of situations. So it is imperative that you focus all of your fire on this guy or he will fuck your shit up. On top of the infected, you're gonna have to navigate maps that will hold nothing back in trying to screw you over. We made it! I can't believe we made it! Son, we just crossed the street. Let's not throw a party until we're out of the city. Each map in Left 4 Dead 2 is memorable in their own way, but I just want to cover a couple here to give you a sense of how masterfully crafted these levels are. The first map, Dead Center, is the perfect starting point for the game, as it starts on the rooftop of a hotel that you must work your way down slowly. This map introduces you to each character in the main roster and sends you down a descending and tight claustrophobic hotel that is slowly burning down. The map design is also perfect because the flames Holy shit, it's so fucking bad. In all seriousness here, this level is the perfect intro. You go from a close quarters combat situation to the streets of the city where you slowly make your way down each winding road until you hit a gun store. The gun store is also a perfect introduction to almost every weapon that you can find in the game. This is also where the game introduces you to horde events that are completely unavoidable and are only initiated by you doing certain activities. And in the case of Dead Center, it's grabbing Whitaker, the gun store owner, a pack of cola so that he can fucking shoot an RPG at a gas tanker to explode it and clear your path. That's how I used to clear a path when I played college ball. Now that's badass. You then enter the mall where you must go through the vast open expanses, which are broken up by tight backroom areas. All of this culminating in the finale where you must work together to fill the stock car of Jimmy Gibbs Jr. Ooh. Ooh. No fucking way! Reloading! No fucking way, Jimmy Gibbs! Just to preface, that zombie only has like a 5% chance of spawning, and I've never seen it before, so I was fucking stoked to see that shit. This part can also get super hectic and always gets my heart pounding as you have to search for 18 million gas canisters to fill this damn Dynaco car up. 
Oh, Rochelle, Rochelle. Dude, Rochelle's gonna Dude, pop Rochelle. it off. Dude, Rochelle's Rochelle. gonna pop it off. Come here. Come on. No, what is she doing? No, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Oh, she's resing. Okay. No, fuck! Oh my god, is that a tank? Yes! Oh my god. No. Just fucking go! Yes! Let's go! Let's go! Oh my god, dude. The next map in line is also superb. Dark Carnival, as it's titled, leads you through a local amusement park. Once you enter the park, there are plenty of cool side things to do, like a whack-a-mole machine or a strongman game. We're even playing a shooting gallery type game where at the end of it, if you get enough points, you get the game's beloved Noam Chomsky. Healing. I'm actually really pissed about this one because I got the achievement with my buddies for carrying that thing all the way to the end of the level but I wasn't fucking recording and I'm not doing that shit again so you're just gonna have to see the screenshot and take my word for it. Speaking of the end though, this level ends with Coach and Ellis realizing that the Midnight Riders, a fictional band that they both love, was playing in a concert before the infected arrived. So you actually use their concert stage to attract a helicopter flying through the area in order to escape the carnival. This leads to an absolutely awesome fight scene where rock music and fireworks are going off like crazy as you mow down hordes of zombies. There are too many maps to go over, but just through those examples you can see how well thought out each level was. Even though some maps like Hard Rain may make me want to pull my fucking hair out with the rain and endless supply of witches in the sugar fields that make it almost impossible to navigate that map. Easy that the rain is picking up like crazy. Oh my god. And especially the fact that I gotta go back through it again. I can still enjoy these maps though besides those facts just because of how well crafted and beautifully made each of these maps are down to the tiniest of details. Besides the map and characters, two important aspects that provide the cherry on top in terms of overall enjoyability and immersion is the music and the audio cues that convey information to the player as well as the art direction which works in tandem with the music and audio cues to create a dark and depressing atmosphere for the player. Excuse me. Bless you. That was cute. Put that in the video now. Oh, wait, here, guys. I'm putting it in the video. Oh my god. The sound design in this game is immaculate. To start, each and every special infected has their own sound cues that alert you to their presence. This can either come in the form of small instrumental segments, which I've been playing for you whenever I introduce the infected, or even just the idle noises they make while they're moving around the map trying to get you. The horde music is also killer. It's fast paced and leaves no room to think because your mind is scrambling trying to find either a holdable position or a pathway to cut through the hundreds of infected swarming towards you to get to the safe room. Each level also has its own music that is specifically themed around it, like The Parish, which takes place in New Orleans and has trumpets and brass instruments featured, and they are used in great effect to sell the fact that you're in the birthplace of jazz. There's even little tiny easter eggs like the jukeboxes that are placed in various maps that will play some of the game's licensed music from bands like Clutch or Jonathan Colton from They Might Be Giants. Another key component that sets Left 4 Dead 2 apart from its predecessors and counterparts is the gore factor. Each zombie has hundreds of ways that it can be killed, with chunks of zombies being blown off with your weapon, or with your melee weapon you're just slicing through zombies, leaving limbs everywhere, or even just absolutely smashing into a zombie with your guitar. The combinations are endless and they are always satisfying. Another amazing way to kill the infected is by using a chainsaw, because it makes you feel like a badass as you're just mowing through zombies and blood and guts are spilling everywhere. Turtle Rock and Valve also realized that if these maps stayed the same every time you played them, then the game would get stale quickly.
The director itself is probably one of the most important parts of this game in its entirety, as it is an insanely intelligent AI that was designed to make each run through of the game's levels unique. The director chooses where to spawn special infected in order to challenge the players. It will place cars in different areas that if shot can alert the horde. And if it's too easy for you, or the survivors are taking too long to get to the exit, the director will call a horde of zombies or even a tank to try and spice things up. The director can even change the layout of the levels themselves, with certain areas and levels morphing and moving around, like the cemeteries in the parish or entire areas that you're traveling through in the passing. All of these aspects combine together to create an unforgettable and challenging experience that can test the mettle of any seasoned FPS player, so going in alone isn't always the best option. <laughs> Left 4 Dead 2 utilizes teamwork perfectly, as each member of your squad needs to work together in perfect harmony to make it through each zone of a level. If someone lags behind too far, or even goes too far ahead, you best be damn sure that the director is going to spawn in a special infected to take him out. All of this is happening, by the way, while the rest of the team struggles to catch up, or has to go backwards a big chunk away to try and help their teammate. Teamwork is also very important because you need to be there for one another. And things like hordes and zombies and special infected will put your teamwork skills to the test. This is because you must work together to do things like clear hordes or focus all your fire on a tank that is barreling towards you at light speeds. Of course, working with a teammate also adds the human element to the game. Everyone is unpredictable and will sometimes do questionable things that can turn an easy experience into absolute hell for you and the rest of your team. Remember those cars and witches I was talking about? All it takes is one person missing their shot or acting devious to put the survival of the party in danger. And if the party members are feeling extra dickish, they can even gun you down as friendly fire does exist and it does a hell of a lot of damage if you're not paying attention. However, if working together properly, you feel unstoppable, as even the hordes of zombies running at you can be taken down with ease. This game also encourages working together as you can heal your teammates with med kits or hand them pills and adrenaline shots to help heal them up. You can also revive your teammates with defibrillators if they die within the course of combat. Once again though, foul play is pretty common as there will be that one guy that uses all your med kits or will just run ahead and take the pills and adrenaline or anything of any use to anybody else in the party. All in all though, without your team it would be almost impossible to get through each level and because of that Valve has batted it out of the park with designing a game that requires you to work together in every conceivable aspect. This helps to create a timeless masterpiece that can be an entertaining party game for you and your buddies to boot up if you just want to turn your brains off and just shoot some zombies for fun. In conclusion, Left 4 Dead 2 is a prime example of what can be done right if a development team puts care and attention into every aspect of a co-op experience to maximize the fun and enjoyment for all parties involved. This game is also a testament to the fact that Valve just can't make a bad game, and Lord Gaben himself will ensure that until he retires to his hobbit hole in New Zealand. This game is a timeless classic and shows that even with time constraints that a masterpiece can be developed and beloved by millions from around the world. But that being said, I'm going to have to give this game a 9 out of 10. If it wasn't for abusable mechanics that can absolutely ruin a run if you had a bad teammate, or a better AI that can actually help you out if you go down, then this game would be a 10 out of 10, any day of the week, hands down. But these limitations hold the game back from its fullest potential. With that being said, if it wasn't for Left 4 Dead 2, I probably wouldn't have ever gotten interested in other zombie shooters, and I probably would have missed out on other great games like Dead Rising or Dead Space. So I'm very thankful that I got the chance to play this as a child, and I'm even more thankful that I've had the opportunity to sit here and share with you a game that I hold near and dear to my heart. And thank you for watching. Thank you guys for watching and I hope that this review has helped you out or entertained you enough to inspire you to give this game a run through. I also just want to let you guys know that this is definitely not the last of my reviews and that there will be a new one coming out soon, hopefully within the next few weeks, and we will be covering one of the most infamous games to ever exist, 
Duke Nukem forever.